Hey, I'm just setting up for the second day of my nonlinear FEA training. Today we will discuss nonlinear material, so I figured that I will share some content from today's training with you, but to do that we actually need to move to my laptop. Of course, the discussion about nonlinear material should start with a stress strain curve, and I'm pretty certain you've seen it already. You can notice on the left that at the beginning, material acts elastically, and then there is a plastic plateau, which means that when you use a B linear material model on the right, it's actually pretty reasonable, I would say. But of course, charts seem pretty scientific, so let's make it a bit simpler. Imagine that nonlinear material works like this. There are three guys, and they are trying to keep a heavy stone over their head. You can notice that the guy in the middle is too short, and he simply cannot help the other two. However, those two guys can kneel, and this makes the shorter guy able to help, because now he can reach out and help them. This is basically how plasticity works. I mean, what happened is that when the guys were kneeling, they were still holding the rock, but they were also moving downward at the same time, so the deformations were increasing, while the amount of force they kept with a stone with was constant. And then, thanks to the fact that they got lower, the other guy could help. Looking at this example, you can see several limits. First of all, strain can, cannot be too high. I mean, there is only so much you can squat until it's all done. Also, this can't happen all too often. If those guys will squat and stand up, squat and stand out, fatigue will kick in. And this will be a very, very serious uh, problem. There is also a mention of isotropic and kinematic hardening, which will change how those guys kneel and stand up uh, in different load conditions, let's call it this way. But on a more serious note, we can of course show how plasticity works on a humble, simply supported beam. Just imagine that I cut out a rectangle from the middle and make a small close-up. Of course, if the case is linear, you can see that the normal stress behaves in a linear way, which is something to be expected. However, I think it's much more effective to think about this rectangle as if something that will deform. So, if I would extremely increase horizontal deformations, this is how the deformations will look like. On the top, the rectangle got shorter because of a compression, and at the bottom, it would be in tension. I can, of course, overlay the original shape with the deformed shape, and you can notice that on the top, the shape compressed a lot, and on the bottom, the shape extended a lot. This means that there is high strain at the top and at the bottom, while in the middle, almost nothing happens. I can, of course, plot the strain depending on the rotation. So the higher the rotation, bigger the strain is in my cross-section. This is kind of obvious. And now let's consider this. If I have a strain in the green zone on the chart, then, when I increase strain, the stresses increases as well, in a linear way. But, if I reach a strain I will denote as epsilon, then the strain can increase, but the stress remains constant. So, in my beam, on the top, you can see how strain changes. Initially, the maximum value is epsilon, so I'm still everywhere within the green zone, so the stress distribution is beautifully linear, because the stress and strain relationship in the green zone is linear. However, the more the strain arises, the bigger part of the cross-section has a strain higher than epsilon, which means that even though strain increased, the stress remained constant at a yield value, which means that in subsequent steps of the analysis, more and more of the cross-section is carrying the maximum capacity, which is the yield strength of my steel. And basically, this is how nonlinear material work, thanks to the fact that the material can strain itself, so deform itself more, even though the stresses are not rising, they are also not falling lower, which allows bigger and bigger parts of the cross-section 
to take more and more load. Just in, like in case of those two guys at the sides that kneel, allowing the middle guy to help carrying the stone. And basically, this is how nonlinear material work. Of course, if you do a linear analysis, not including plastic properties in any way, you will quickly notice that even if you are quote-unquote outside of the green zone, so technically the material should yield, in a linear model you are using linear pro projection of stress. This means that the model assumes that the relationship between strain and stress is always linear, regardless of reality. This means that over, if you have high strain values, then linear stress values will be unrealistically high, even higher than ultimate strength of your material. That is, of course, not the case in reality, because you should, instead of assuming linear properties, take into, into account nonlinearities, and you would get a correct value in such a case. What is important to understand is that the high stress you get in your model doesn't disappear. It just goes elsewhere, which means that if you have a linear model and there is a lot of stress in one spot, in reality, it will be spread around on a nearby locations, thanks to plasticity. And this is how the model will cope with this quote-unquote unrealistic stress value. But let's take a look at how this works in a simple beam. Notice that the plastic deformations are pretty funny here. This is because this beam has a very, very thin web. This is a classical welded cross-section, and it's in class 4. This means that when yielding starts, the element cannot carry any more, and basically the stress-strain curve or equilibrium path look like this. It simply reaches a certain value of capacity, and then yielding basically means that the element is destroyed. Of course, we can normalize the deformations which means that on the horizontal axis, instead of having displacements in millimeters, we have displacement in relation to load, which means that if the load is 0, 1, and displacement is 0, 1 as well, this means the model is linear. Notice that somewhere around load 0, 2, the displacement got easily higher than 0, 4, which means that material starts to yield excessively, and it's not a linear problem anymore. Of course, we can make something funny. Let's just change the web thickness to 16 millimeters. Of course, we won't do the whole example here as we'll do on the training, but this should suffice just to know that I did that. Notice that now the cross section at the edges are in class one, so they don't actually lose plastic stability or deform in any bizarre way. They just form a plastic hinge. This in turn, allow to redistribute the load toward the center of the beam when another, where another plastic hinge develops. And now you can see that it really nicely breaks because there are three plastic hinges in a row which makes the beam unstable. And I think that this is one of the mostly overlooked aspects of nonlinear material. Everybody thinks that what nonlinear material does is basically it copes somehow with the stresses higher than yield. But there is also a lot of other aspects, nonlinear material impacts on your analysis, and that would be one of them. If you would like to do the same analysis with linear analysis, well, it's basically impossible. So here you can see the blue chart representing the beam with the stiffer, thicker web, and the orange one with the previous analysis. Of course, with the stiffer web, the beam does not actually deform in the same way, so it's hard to compare those charts. But if I normalize the displacement, so I check when they are linear and when they are not, you can easily see that the deformations I get are almost linear to somewhere about 0, 2 of the load multiplier for this weaker beam, and in the stronger beam, somewhere around 0.25, maybe 0.3, something happens. This is where the first plastic 
uh, hinge actually forms and instead of rigidly rigidly support beam we have a hinge beam which means that it's more elastic it deforms more so the curve is less steep and then uh, the plastic hinge in the center forms and this means that the beam has three hinges in a row and is almost ready to collapse of course, since I have an ultimate plastic plateau, this beam won't be bent downward, downward and downward, including more and more elements into the plastic failure, but I can check plastic strain to know at which level this is unacceptable, clearly. This is the example we do on a course, and I figured that you can learn a lot about plasticity from such studies and such analysis. Just remember that Whatever you do, um, nonlinear material does not only deal with how much stress you have where and why it's higher than yield. It also can impact how your model behaves in general. And it's a very good idea to remember about it. Because when you omit nonlinear material, this can actually impact in a way your model will fail. And that's something that you shouldn't really overlook if that's the case. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you want to test your skills in FEA, I prepared a free FEA quiz for you. You can find the link below. Just click it and in a few simple questions, you will be able to estimate how much you actually know about FEA. And I think it's pretty fun, so see you there.